Well, good evening and welcome to the Oasis podcast. I am John Mark Yoder and I'm here with Wayne Weaver. And we're glad that uh, you're here, whoever you are that are joining us tonight. And um, we try to do these every Tuesday night, at least as much as possible. So we discuss about anything that's on our hearts, uh, usually something that's fairly serious. We've had a couple of times we laugh and have a good time, but um, we always have a good time. time. But it's just sometimes Mm -hmm. it's more humorous than others. But anyway, if you like... um, what you see here, please uh, hit the like button and subscribe to this uh, podcast, and uh, also send us your comments to library at oasistabernacle.org. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Tonight, though, our topic is something we started last week. Well, actually, we were finishing up, and then you said, you know, one of the things we need to speak about is the sequence of healing. So that's what we're titling this tonight, is The Sequence of Healing. And um, you and I haven't really spoken about this topic no. uh, throughout the week, so I'm not sure where we're going with this. But I thought I'd start with a couple of comments. Um, uh, for one, we like the word healing. At least most of us like the idea of being healed, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, things that have been out of place or set back to right. doctors make good money. Yeah, that's right. All is well, the pain is gone, things are working properly. Mm -hmm. And I remember years ago listening to you preach somewhere, and you were talking about healing. And uh, you made the statement, you know, when we pray for healing and we say there's healing, the person's made well. I mean, he doesn't continue on with that problem. And I've been places where people say, well, I think I was healed, they prayed for me, but it sort of continues on, and, and that can be a bit of a problem because um, it either demonstrates that the healing was ineffective or the prayer was ineffective or something. But I, I just remember that statement you had made saying, you know, when you pray for healing, if there's healing, the person's well. The problem goes away. If there's healing. But in reality, the word healing kind of gives me a little bit of a pause because that means for something to need healing, it must have been broken or damaged or weak or something. And I don't like any of those terms, really. I'm not fond of them when they happen in my life, and they happen frequently. I am often in one of those situations. So I'm guessing that the sequence of healing, if we're talking about that, needs to start somewhere with brokenness. Or maybe it starts before that. I don't know. But it'll be interesting. I want to I wanna begin by just reading a couple of psalms because healing ultimately comes from God. Wholeness, wellness. Mm-hmm. God created everything and it was good. Sin came, things broke. Mm-hmm. But ultimate healing still comes back to God. So Psalm 30, verse 2, this is Old Testament. It says, O Lord my God, I cried out to you, and you healed me. And then Psalm 107, verse 20 says, He sent his word and healed them. And then it also goes on to say, And delivered them from their destructions. So the sequence of healing. What kind of healing are we talking about? (laughs) Healing, um, I mean, this is healing or delivering from their destructions. Uh, We talk about physical healing. We talk about spiritual healing. Um, Healing is a term we throw around. So let's define that a little bit. What are we talking about tonight? (laughs) Well, all right, since we didn't talk a whole lot in between here, um, um, but I'll say this, that the sequence of healing, uh, giving reference to different types of healing as well. So we know that Israel was backslidden. Mm -hmm. And God said, I will heal their backsliding. Hmm, interesting. Why would, we would normally think repentance is what's needed for backsliding. But here God says, healing. Healing. And where the Bible also talked, which we talked about this last uh, Tuesday evening, uh, where we talked about the verse that was brought up, 
if we confess our faults one to another, you know, mm-hmm. and, it's, yeah. and then we'll be healed. So a fault is re- giving reference to how to overcome it is by way of healing. So there's different types of healings. And I would like to say this, if I could, right in the beginning, because I think this is really important. <coughs> Excuse me. Put a little bit of water there, but it still didn't work. Sorry, mm-hmm. I might have to do some more of that. Um, when we think healing in our day and age, what is often given, uh, what people often refer to is somebody got hurt. Mm-hmm. Their feelings got hurt. I am not talking about that tonight. There is, so we're there not is, particularly dealing with victimhood no, and that no, kind of thing. No, 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 not at all. Okay. I mean, those are things that if you, if you, if your feelings get hurt, all of our feelings get hurt. We do. We all. We all have things happen that we don't like, right. things that uh, that hurt us, things that we don't agree with in our heart, or things that jab us, and that doesn't feel good. But that's not at all what I'm talking. There, the, the type of healing I'm talking is much deeper than that. That's something that if the sun shines, that goes away sometimes. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I'm not talking feeling stuff, and I think this is very important to say this. However... Let me say that when, when the, the, the process of healing uh, in what God calls healing from a backslider to a fault, um, and he puts that in, into the same category as people needing healing, I'm, I'm looking at, um, let me just say it this way. When someone has surgery, um, a lot of times what happens because of a surgery, there is a wound that starts healing, and it heals outside of pattern. The DNA doesn't put the perfect seam together. Sure. And sometimes it continues to grow healing that actually interferes. People that have... Scar tissue. Scar tissue. People that have scar tissue in different places, then all at once it complicates things. Um, and, And so what do they need? As in the process of that healing... There was scar; it, it overhealed, and there was scar uh, scar tissue, and as a result, there's other issues that creep up. And what I'm looking at is the deeper sense of healing that when something happens to you, uh, and I've been kind of dwelling on this for the last while, where David said that he was formed in iniquity, and so when things happen to us, where we need a healing. And I'm not talking necessarily psychological healing. However, it can include that. But this feeling thing is just a small part of that. But what often happens is some of these things steer a ship in a complete different direction in what so, uh, than what somebody even purposed to have there, when I say ship, going to. In other words, they end up somewhere completely different than where they were wanting to go because of some other thing that is in them, mm-hmm. that is having interfering with their life, maybe even kind of in an unknown way. Um, I know years ago uh, somebody told me, and there's these modern terms that people have, I was under a lot of, um, a lot of persecution, and then somebody asked me, so you have a martyr's complex? Well... What is that? Oh, is it good or bad? <laughs> well, if so, if you're under, they just asked me if I had that, and I said, well, I really don't know. And I kind of passed it off, but there again, when I look at it and look at my life now that I've lived many years, and I look back, and I see that perhaps there's certain things that have happened to you that has made you turn to the right or to the left, or to avoid certain places and certain things, to avoid them more. And it's as a result of something that maybe was healed or is healed, but there's scar tissue. And that scar tissue wants to stand in the way so you don't have to replay some of those, uh, go to some of those very places you once were. And those are, when I talk about sequence of healing, I'm talking about what type of healing, where it starts to to uh, uh, a healing that takes place and and changes someone's course. Hmm. So 
in 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 a a relational sense, it can and even you're talking about uh, a healing that will actually redirect your thinking or redirect your steps. Yeah, and this can happen partly because you're made completely well, and other times it's because of scar tissue that yeah, develops along the way. Exactly, and, okay. and I look at my life and I see that I have scar tissue, mm-hmm. and even though that the thing doesn't hurt me anymore. And that doesn't hurt me. This doesn't hurt me. But when I look at it, hmm, even though it doesn't hurt, it has taken me on a route that I was not planning on going. And and when I look at well, why was I not planning on going there, and 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 there's people in the everyday workplace that will say, I will never do that again, or I will, you know, I will always stay away from that person, you know, if they have an argument or something like that. And those are some things that will reroute you somewhat. I'm talking about something much deeper, the way we trust God Mm -hmm. or not trust God, the way we look at grace, the way we look at faith, the way we look at mercy. You know, God can't have any mercy. I'm I'm no good. I'm just no good. I'm there's nothing good in me. I've I've, you know, uh, you listen to what people say, you listen to what things tell you, and then all at once you measure everything by that, and now you're just absolutely no good. Those are some things, like I would say, scar tissue type of stuff. The original thing doesn't pain you anymore, mm-hmm. but there are some things that happened, and, and I find that when I look back into my life, I find quite a lot of this in my life, and enough that I wondered, where would I be if it wouldn't have been for some of the unfortunate things that have happened in my life? How different would my life be? How much better would my life be? And I understand that God uses those things. He uses those things. I understand that. But it is still, it is still. I think a lot of people deal with certain things uh, in certain ways that they're just simply not quite aware of what has made them think this way, why a certain person does not like a certain person, because they just heard this maybe even 20 years ago, somebody said something. And now today, I just don't want to like that person. I just kind of stay away from that person. How many times have you heard that? There's somebody I just don't, have never learned to trust that person. Why is that? Why is that? It is some, if you go back and look a little bit, you'll find why you can't trust that person. Mm-hmm. And and I think some of those things can divert your ways and divert your divert the grace of God. The the thing on the martyr syndrome is is and I don't want to call it a martyr syndrome. That's uh, it's just a modern way of saying that. And and the other thing is you really if you really are not qualified to talk much about it unless you've gone through it. That's just one of those things. And I understand that I have gone through it. But there's things that, you know, it, people, there was a time when almost everyone would, for extended periods of time, for years, all they ever had to say is bad things. Why do you think God said, if there's any virtue, if there's any praise, think on huh? these things? Yeah. These things. What are these things? Good reports. Mm-hmm. So we we tend to look at bad reports and form our future, form our life, form my our my mentality, my grace, the grace of God, the mercy of God. All this we tend to form it around that, uh, and we don't realize that. Allow the good reports also to be in in the picture when these formations start taking place in your life. So as you as you're talking about the the sequence of healing there would be some that would say well when god heals he doesn't he take care of the scar tissue mhm um, yeah he can mhm yeah he can um but that's continued healing that comes after later mm-hmm. uh look at lazarus so we look at lazarus and lazarus was a dead man he died of a disease obviously um and so when Jesus came to the grave, they had him all wrapped up, and he asked yeah, they him to come out. they thought he was up. smelling already. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mary, Mary and Martha didn't want Jesus to even get clothes because it is already uh, deteriorating, and, and, and it's a smelly tomb. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and then Jesus just called his name, and he came out of the tomb. But he walked with a lot of difficulty. 
He had his legs wrapped or his feet wrapped. He had a napkin over his eyes. He couldn't see. And then he looked to the disciple and said, free him. That is what I see in a lot of this. Um, there's things that we bandage up and we never take off. Mm -hmm. You know, we just, we take it for granted. You know, I always have to be careful with this person, that person, and, and, and never get too close, never trust him again, never trust her again. And th those are some baggages and badge or uh, bandages that we carry with us that I think it's part of the sequence of healing is those things need to come off too. So in, in that process, the cast needs to be taken out yeah. off the arm. It's it's healed up, but in order to strengthen, you're going to have to get rid of that. The mm -hmm. bandages have to come off so that yeah. the dead yeah. man can actually come back uh, and be live alive. Again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. can see, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Je Jesus, I mean, Lazarus was obviously alive. He was right. not dead. No. He was no longer dead. No, but he had needs. And those needs then were met through, interesting, his disciples. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't do it. He told his disciples to do it. So in the... In the life of the church, we we should not be surprised then for people who have been dramatically healed and transformed by the the power and grace of God to still need some bandages removed, some mm -hmm. uh, yeah. further, defenses, some further medication mm -hmm. applied, yeah. whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. I now I look back. I you know I I was under the persuasion for many years that when Jesus heals, he's boom, you're healed like that, and 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 he does. But in the line of healing from the things that, it, that we're saying, faults, mm -hmm. faults need, you get set free from faults by what? It's by way of healing, by confessing, by sharing it. That's what the Bible says. Confess your faults one to another that you may be healed. And then it t talks about the righteous person praying over it and so forth. That's part of it. Mm -hmm. But if you don't share it, nobody's going to pray for it either. So, so it, it, it it's both of those things that you need. You need the exposure or take the bandages off, all right? Take that off and let someone pray for you. And well, that's kind of interesting because you have that picture with Lazarus coming out of the tomb. It's a great illustration. He's, he's alive. He comes out. Yeah. But basically that declaration standing in the door of the tomb, he's still bound up. Yeah. And it's a little bit of confessing your faults. Okay, fellas, mm -hmm. a little help yeah. is needed, right? I need some help. <laughs> I need some. <laughs> yeah, I need some help. Yeah. Even my hands are bandaged up. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. And there's probably the rakes probably had a little stench to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you take them off, the stench should leave. Um, I, I just think it's it's important. As, as I look back in my life, I wish I would have been instructed a bit different. But I'm a person that faces reality, and I'm a person that that when I, as I see truth, I, I reveal it. And this is one thing that I would have for years in heavy preaching and, and all that, would have never thought I'd come to a place where I would actually admit that there are some things that I've done different because of things I've gone through. And that came as a result of pain. Now, as I'm getting older, those things are coming to the surface where I'm seeing that I, I've probably never dealt with it properly. Probably never dealt with it properly. I was young, was full of vigor, and I'm getting older, and I'm drawing some conclusions and adding all the numbers together, come up with a sum, and and this is what I'm seeing: that as much as I would not want to admit, life in its defeats and life in things that I've experienced and gone through has taken a toll on me, mm -hmm. and has also um, steered me some. And I just, I just. And, and, and then you run across that verse, I will heal their backslidings. You know, I remember and I will love them freely. So what's missing there? I will heal their backslidings. So obviously a person that's backslidden got hurt somewhere. Now I'm not talking feelings got hurt, mm -hmm. all right? But got hurt. Something got damaged. Something got damaged, yes. yeah. And, and uh, somebody might say, well, how else do you get hurt? Um, yeah, there's many ways to get hurt. You can have your faith broken, things that break your faith, even mm -hmm. just between you and God. You pray for sick people and they don't get healed. But how many times will you pray for sick people if they don't get healed? If I have to pray for sick people or, or needy people of something and they never change and never change, you think I'm going to keep on doing it? 
See what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And all at once, it's it it deals with your confidence in in the Lord. There's things that that I think we've all felt already in our in our lives that God has let us down. Times when I really needed, He was not present that you could sense. He would. He's like, how can this happen to me? And and you could turn on God and and. The sequence of healing is all those different types of things, but they start by admitting and seeing, I do have a problem. Mm-hmm. And, and that journey can take can yeah. take some time. It can take some different ways. And we might even find ourselves in the process of that, sidestepping yeah. certain exactly. situations exactly and difficulties. Right. Okay. Exactly right. That's that's very that's, that's, that's yeah, that's very that's helpful. Me. That's me. So, what do you what do you tell somebody who is you know obviously we're, we're talking to a lot of people who are out here and who may listen to this in later later days and, and months, but they are looking at life. We we don't necessarily know where they are in that sequence of healing, yeah. but knowing that these things come, mm-hmm. knowing that I should be on the lookout. If you would have known this twenty years ago, I wish I would have. What are what are I some things that you think um, you would tell your younger self? Um, go back and revisit some of those places that you th- that you thought were all okay, but you just kind of covered it over and smeared it over and became bigger, mm-hmm. and just be a stronger man, a tougher man, and go on. Don't let those things affect you. Just don't. Um, you know, this is kind of the way you dealt with it. That's really not dealing with it. One of those things, a big one, is absolute forgiveness. And that's in the sequence of healing. Forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is so important. And if you can't properly forgive, it can't properly heal. And you will not properly be released. And I would have thought, you know, just by saying, oh, well, let, let him talk. That's not forgiving them by name. I, God had me had deal, uh, dealt with me at a certain point where I had to go back to all of these people uh, in prayer. And I've related this story before, but I had to name and almost relive this moment of what they did, what happened, and all that, and forgiven them by name. And he asked me to do it three times before there was... Uh, freedom. But even then, later, scar tissue can bring it back up. Right. And there's a temptation to pull those things mm-hmm. up and to, you, to even the temptation to start thinking about them. Yes, exactly. And when you think about them and replay the mm-hmm. event, even if you start thinking, I'm over this, mm-hmm. there's some little yes, hook there in is. there that can get in there mm-hmm. and get you mm-hmm. uh, angry yeah. and bitter and bitter. resentful. Yeah. But I think the other thing that you mentioned is is fully forgive. I think in ministry, I've noticed this as I've talked with people because we want to be spiritual about this, and Mm -hmm. we we know we need to forgive. And I've heard a lot of people say things like, well, I really can't hold it against them because, or I can't do this because they meant well, I know their, their heart. Well, you can't forgive something if you can't acknowledge that it was a wrong. And a lot of people excuse sins mm-hmm, yeah. or hurts and mm-hmm. try to say, well, it hurts, but I can't really do anything about it because... But I, I, I encourage people to, to at least acknowledge the wrong. Yeah. Because when you acknowledge that it was wrong, you can then say, I choose to forgive. But as long as you're excusing it, it still sits out here. Mm-hmm. It's there, but how do you deal with it? Well, I, I just have to write it off. Mm-hmm. But I think to be able to really forgive it, you have to acknowledge that it was wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and absolutely. That it you have to. You have to. Um, I mean, look at Jesus on the cross. When he was on the cross, one of the last things he said, Father, forgive them. Why did he say that? Why was one of the last things he said on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what? They do. Mm -hmm. And in that, it's obvious that there was some pain and conflict that was going on in him that he would have naturally, like we, not wanted to forgive this because it was so much injustice. Mm -hmm. It was so wrong what they were doing. They were so not understanding the moment. And they were so not understanding the intention. You know, it looked like this this guy is crazy. He's 
you know, what he's, he's a nuisance to our, our land, to the nation of Israel and all that. And he causes trouble everywhere he goes. And, but Jesus saw the whole picture was much deeper. And, but he needed to forgive them before he met God, even the Father. He had to forgive them. And that is, that is such a beautiful picture. And at the same time that he could recognize the wrong, he qualifies that and he says, they're doing the wrong and they don't even know it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I think sometimes we say, well, it's wrong, but I can't do anything because they don't know better. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, no, forgive the wrong. And yeah. also added, they don't know what they're doing. Yeah. <coughs> excuse me. Wow. Another thing that's interesting that I think he called. <coughs> excuse me. I don't know why I'm coughing. There it is again. Um, as you grow older, things look a little different mm -hmm. than they do when you're younger. And I just wish, like, I just, one, one, one thing that would really help, that would have helped me is if I would have had a close group right around me that I could have confided in more. People that you can confide things, really being very clear about it, and just confide it. People that offer understanding. And even if they don't have understanding, uh, some, just a little group that could just, you can confide that in them and just say that, you know, this this here happened and, this really hurt me, and I have a hard, I have a hard time with this because now I don't want to pray for anybody anymore. Because um, some misunderstanding about uh, something that I prayed for when I prayed for somebody in church, and somebody made a statement, and it it really when I say hurt me, I'm not talking feelings. Come on, but it wants to stop me. I just don't want to do that again because you become vulnerable, and it's like every time you think of it. Uh, you know, should I do this or something? You think of a certain person that said so and so, and that has changed some things in my life. That has taken freedom away, and I also understand there is something to this because Jesus could not do many mighty miracles in Nazareth, his hometown, because they didn't acknowledge him as the Son of God, but also that he is just Joseph's son. And and in that demeaning, demeaning uh, presence, the Holy Spirit would not allow him to do many miracles. And I understand that. This is also why Jesus sometimes told people to go out when he prayed for people. He prayed for people, and he told even his disciples to to go out at times. I don't know exactly why, but based on maybe a prior conversation in the last day or two. He didn't want them there when he did this because he didn't have the freedom. Mm -hmm. I've noticed this. <coughs> Excuse me. I've noticed at times when I've been asked to pray that there are certain things I'm just not free to pray a certain way because of some incident that happened just in the past week. Um, and and so I, I just kind of robs my freedom of that. And these are some of the little scar tissue things that can divert you from, and I know that there's there's people that will say, well, don't you just listen to what God says and not care about people? That's easy said, and I could do it for some years, but as I'm getting older, it doesn't quite work that way. Um, I'm, I'm, I see more of the whole picture now, uh, and yes, I, I, li I listen to what God says, and I'm careful what God says, and God asked me directly, to do a certain thing, I will do that certain thing. But there are certain things that might have happened in the audience that I am in the middle of that will rob that freedom from me. Jesus mm -hmm. experienced that in Nazareth. And I, I think when you, you're talking about this sequence of healing again, there are things that in the immediate aftermath of a wound or something like that, it can be in the process of healing, mm -hmm. but you're going to favor that a little bit. Mm -hmm. There's going yeah, to be yeah, a situation yeah. where you won't um, mm -hmm. where you won't necessarily exercise that completely. Mm -hmm. An athlete who who tears a ligament or a yeah. tendon or something <coughs> is is going to take, even though things have been set back to rights, um, as they strengthen and grow back. There's that 
Mm-hmm. There's that gaining, regaining of strength, and um, and I that's it's an interesting concept when we when you put it into the topic of healing yeah. because I think especially healing spiritually and emotionally, um, mentally, even at times, walking in these areas, you know, people that would ask the question, aren't you supposed to just listen to God? Mm-hmm. Well, there's something yeah. that God does in the heart of a mm-hmm. pastor, mm-hmm. and he makes him sensitive to the people. That's right. And you you don't just make decisions in a vacuum. Mm-hmm. You're constantly weighing what you hear from the Lord yeah. by... Mm-hmm. And you're looking at the people, not that you're taking your cues from them, but you're you're processing how does this work? Well, and basically, the life of a pastor is basically one thing: it's, it, it is listening and leading, listening and leading, listening what God says. You also listen what people say, mm-hmm. and then leading. And and it definitely has influence on you. Now, this is part of the thing that I find. Um, how should I say this? I struggle sometimes with some ministries that are out there. They're not pastors, but they certainly lead people around and do things, but they're not pastors. And if you're not with them all the time, a lot of those people are very difficult to get along with. And that's sometimes the very reason that they're kind of out alone because they are not able to surround themselves with a body that they can lead because uh, they're too critical or they're not they're just not pastor or, or they're not shepherd uh, shepherd uh, quality people and those people need to be careful because I've seen this um, the, the pastor's heart is like I say you hear and you lead you hear. You hear from the Lord. And if you don't hear from the Lord, you hear from the people. If you don't hear from the people, you hear from the Lord or all of it combined. And so it's it's a constant thing. It, there's a lot more mechanics to it, spiritual mechanics, if I can say, than meets the eye. Mm-hmm. And, and where if you are a ministry type of thing, you just go in, flash, boom, do your thing and leave. And come again, go to that place, flash, bang, and it's all glory, it's all life, it's all awesome. Walk with those people ones. And I challenge people to do that. And, and same with some of you that are listening to us now that are do not belong to Oasis. It can be the same thing that you can look to us and say that we said this and we say that. and You follow a lot what we say. But unless you really learn to walk right with us, because I always want people to also see my faults. It's not good that they only measure me by what they see as a, a model, a mm-hmm. role model in something. But they also need to see my faults. And if I, can, if I shield them from my faults, I'm not a good leader. I'm, and I, I'm not a correct leader. I'm not, I'm not how should I say this? It, it, I'm not a spiritual leader. That's the better word. Because I want people to know who I am, how I walk, how I deal with problems, problems that I might find it very difficult to deal with, sometimes that I run up against the wall, I can't move, and I want people to know that I, uh, so that they can have a proper judgment of who they really have in their midst. And this is why I say to a lot of the ministries, a lot of ministries that are out there that have never had pastoral, um, any type of pastoral experience, they need to be very careful, and even the followers of them need to be very careful because it's easy to go to, yeah, uh, and come. It's easy to, for people, even from other churches and other areas, come to one of our conferences and go home all, you know, just oh, yeah. But be amongst us and see some faults and see some things that vary with your opinions and get a healthy picture of it and see if you can still walk with us. See what I'm saying or mm-hmm. walk with me. This is the better way, and and I, for that reason, would tend to think that the five gifts belong in a church. Mm-hmm. Now, it can be used outside into other churches, but the five gifts as a whole are the gifts that operate in the church, where there is a apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, and evangelist. 
Well, and there's there's something so powerful about that. I think even in this whole conversation about healing, uh, going back to the the picture of Lazarus and the disciples unwrapping him, there is something also in the the gifts that come to the church where they are literally honed and made better by their combination yeah. with the others. Yeah. They because we're not independent. Mm-hmm. And so all of these gifts are meant to work in conjunction for the edification of the body. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Joined together like like a body. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, I've been part of parachurch organizations. I've mm-hmm. been I've been a pastor. Mm-hmm. I've been on both sides of that fence. Mm-hmm. And I found that um, prior to being a pastor, um, I would have found it easy to be critical of pastors. And you walk in and you hear a little bit of the story and you, yep. you say, well, if, if that pastor knew anything, he'd be doing this. Well, the thing mm-hmm. that I had to realize is that there's a lot I didn't know. I saw right. one side on a couple of days and I said, wow, yeah. who could fault this wonderful person? Only to discover that this wonderful person, um, as they presented to me, um, Probably should have had a bath uh, before coming out of the grave. You know, they they had a stench to them, and and I so I think, I, I think those are areas where when you are in a parachurch organization, mm-hmm. you are trying to help people to healing. It's a it's a noble effort, yeah. but without walking with them, without walking That's with a them, big difference. Exactly, huge it's, difference. It's, you can it's, heal, and you can speak it, and you can walk away from it, and now. It, it's it the is. midwife or the doctor at the birth, but they're not yep. raising all these yep. children. Yeah, and I experienced that. Mm-hmm. I was uh, largely used uh, for evangelistic things, and I'd go in and have meetings, and great things happen, and then I'd go home, and they never walk with me. And I saw, as a result, a lot of instability in people. Even in our own church, I saw instability because I was not here I was there, 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 everywhere, and once in a while I was here and then there again. And it, it and I just saw, I, I, it, it caused me to have the heart of a pastor where I wanted to be there every day to care for them and also the, so that I can walk with them so that they can see me. I was instructed one, one specific time by the Lord that he instructed me, walk with the people like Moses did. And... Mo- and, and and so I did. I, I changed all that. And to walk with the people, I, I wanted them to see me on a ball diamond. When I make a make out, you know, make an out or even a questionable call, see how I respond. I wanted them to see how I respond. And one point I remember I and now we're getting a little off of the, the uh, rabbit trail here, but one point I had to come back to the church Sunday morning. And apologized to the church. I said I had a wrong attitude, uh, and it, it, most of them would not have noticed it. But one of the brothers called me out, and I felt very obvious it was not out. And the others around me said that was not an out. And I just wanted that person to feel a bit condemned because he called me out. That was wrong. So I had I decided it was a church event. So I'm going to say it in front of the whole church and apologize. And I think those are the better things to do. Uh, let, allow the people to see exactly how healed you are, mm-hmm. how gracious you are, how merciful you are, and and how much Jesus you really have. You know what I mean? Exercising his power in you as you walk from day to day, walking in the Spirit. Uh, yeah, I, I just I think it's important. Uh, we don't get a fair... I, I, I used to work with a ministry... Uh, in another city, I won't be more. I won't be clear on that. But a big ministry, very worldwide, uh, very, uh, very, uh, very effective. Mm-hmm. And uh, I worked there, uh, not full time, but I would go there weekends, and I sometimes work, be there all week, and 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 so forth. And then one day, uh, one of the pastors told me that I was very close to. In fact, I could mention his name. A lot of people would know his name. Um, He just said, you know, I just need to share this with you. And he said, you know, 
the main pastor is really hard to get along with. And he said, I was warned when I started and that your days are numbered because he just, he, he has other pastors that work under him that only go for about three years and then they're out. And he said, uh, I'm seeing that. See, now from the perspective of powerful messages and people's lives are changed by it, but then to walk with him. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. that's, a very that's a very different thing. It, it is, it is. And so I never wanted to be a pastor. That would have been the last one. I, I just did not want to be a pastor, but I saw the need of being one. And, and that's what actually... To, uh, that's actually what changed my life. Well, yeah. speaking of speaking of pastors, um, there's a lot of people that lean on you and look to your experience for um, for an example, for direction, for uh, even an idea of where to go mm -hmm. in life. And and many of them are not pastors, but there are many pastors out there who maybe are like you, looking back and saying, "Well, I didn't." heal as well from this or yep. that or the other, yep. or I'm just mm -hmm. simply wore out and, and tired. Mm -hmm. Do you have a word of encouragement for pastors who mm -hmm. are walking that journey, hearing something you're saying today, and they're saying, you know what, maybe maybe I should be rethinking this a bit? Where do they go? Find someone that... Find someone that... I say, find someone you can trust. You almost have to have someone that is able to, uh, someone that has more experience perhaps than what you do yourself, and that has gone through the deep things, that has learned and walked and kept on going, and somehow has not quit. And share your heart, everything. Just share your heart, the frustrations and all that. And I it would be it would be very nice to have a group of people like that where you could have that, where people would just be honest and 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 so forth. But with all the denominational differences, you know the communities that we're at is we can hardly cr uh, crawl across any denominational barriers to have mm -hmm. <laughs> somewhat of a, a confidence friendship thing. And that's sad. It should not be that way. But I, I think that's, for pastors, you know, it's not, this is not an easy job. I have how many businesses? Pastor is by far the hardest job I have ever done in my entire life. Not even close to anything else. It is most, the most difficult thing. Because you're constantly on a pivot point. You're constantly on a pivot of being right or wrong. And that's all opinion based on man. And also, what is God saying in the meantime? And so it can get pretty, pretty severe. Mm -hmm. And and when you're in the midst of a lot of racket, if that means anything, a lot of noise, it's hard to hear. It is. And last Still last small. week you talked about that whole idea of sitting down with um, Brother Mark and just the mm -hmm. healing that came from that. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that having having pastored in a variety of places, sometimes it, within the church, I didn't have those people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, But I would, I would encourage, I know in Saskatchewan at times, I, I crossed denominational boundaries to, and mm -hmm. talked with chaplains mm -hmm. um, and was able to mm -hmm. find a measure of healing. There you could. There, there I you could. could yeah. There I could. Yeah. And I think that there are... Are spots where you you find a follower of Jesus, someone who is mature in the faith, and and speak to them. Yeah. Um, I remember one night we used to have a, a Saturday night prayer night in in one of the churches where I pastored, and and I remember one evening a pastor from another church in the area came, and um, he just said, you know, I have to get something mm -hmm. off of my conscience. He said, I, I was wanting to pray, I, I was wanting to preach tomorrow, and he said, I didn't really know where to go, but I knew I needed to come and confess. And he said, I knew you had the prayer meeting here. And so he came, and it was, it was appropriate what mm -hmm. he shared. Mm -hmm. It just, he didn't have a place to go yeah. in his church. Mm -hmm. 
he was a pastor, you know, and, and mm-hmm. where do I go with this? It was a personal issue yeah. and, and some of those things. So I thought that was interesting, but we held that with confidence. Mm-hmm. Finding a place where you yeah. can go and just speak that. Permitting is a nice good place to do it. Right. And and this was yeah. a, a prayer meeting that was not the typical yeah. gossip prayer meeting. Yeah. It was yeah. it was a very yeah. serious one. But just finding that place, even though it may not be right here, find brothers that you can trust. Find, you know, find a, yeah. a group. Yeah, and even 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 to just open up and say that, you know, I'm going through a very difficult time and you don't really want to say that in front of the whole church. You know, I have already, mm-hmm. but typically just share it with a small group. And like for me right now, as I'm sitting here, you know, there are some people that I know that I could share with. If I'm going through a hard time and I could just share with them and, and I know they wouldn't think any different of me uh, if I just say that I need prayer, it's pretty tough, you know, something mm-hmm. like that, because they do it to me. They'll call me or they'll talk to me and say that uh, I'm just going through a hard time. Those are the very people, the ones that confide in you are often the ones that you can confide in them. Mm -hmm. If they come to you and say that they're going through difficult times or they're facing some things, and they're not quite sure what the whole picture is, you know, maybe this uh, healing thing of something, they're not quite sure. Um, You can... Those whom confide in you, you can confide in them. That's pretty much what I've discovered. Mm-hmm. Well, I think as we're wanting to wrap this up, this yeah. is... Um, and there's healing there. There is healing. That is part yes. of the sequence. Yeah. And in, in Matthew 14, uh, chapter 14, verse 14, uh, this verse just, I, I think, kind of should cause all of us to draw near to Christ in this uh, and to his people. But it just says, when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. Mm-hmm. I and love that. that. that, that I, I know. I, and I agree. I, I agree right with you, even the compassion. I've sensed uh, already where God had moved with uh, a lot of healing um, where there was more than one person got healed, just based it in a prayer or a statement. And it's the compassion, that compassion. And that compassion is one of those that would never point their finger at you. Mm-hmm. See, there's some people that have done that. You remember that. But then there's people that have never pointed their finger uh, at you, and Jesus is one of those that has never pointed his finger at me. And he never will, and he also will never point his finger at you. Um, he just will not do that. In fact, I, I just listened to a testimony of a man that actually was declared dead for an hour and 45 minutes. And he met what he knew was Jesus. And he said, when Jesus met him, he said, I was not in the condition. I was a Christian, but not really in the condition of that I would have felt I would have been ready to meet Jesus. And the presence of Jesus and the facial part of Jesus and what came off of him was so, he would have never even looked at him as, as he had, would have done a, ever anything wrong. Hmm. There's this total clarity. It's like, like, don't even feel that way. Don't even think. Don't, don't go like this. Jesus, our shepherd, our savior, when he forgives, he forgives, and he forgets, and he will not remember it, and he will not look at you shyly and say that, yeah, it's, uh, I know you've made a lot of mistakes. His face was so open and so bright that it was like, like it, was, it was like you would have met a person that has never known you, and all they have ever seen or heard was all good about you. If I can say that, I, I should restate that. But if you would have met a, per, if, if you would meet a person that has always had and listened to the highest things that you have ever done and the best things and never one thing doubtful, Jesus was that way when he met him. It was like like a, just an open picture, like welcome, and and it was not well. I'm so sorry. 
No, I mean, no, on my part, you've never done anything wrong. I don't look at you like that. This is what this man experienced. Mm. And I think that's heaven. Isn't that what heaven is all about? Mm -hmm. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Healing. Healing. Compassion. Restoration. Wow. So for those of you who are laboring on and wherever you are in that sequence of healing, we want to wish you God's Amen. grace and his compassion, his mercy, and as you move to complete healing. And um, he will often do that through the mm -hmm. people around you. Yeah. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a good evening. Thanks for joining Amen. us.